thank you so much for joining uh, myself, Angela Taylor, uh, for everything you wanted to know about supporting complex families. This is just a very um, a light overview of some really important questions that service providers have asked me over the last uh, many, many years. Um, and so um, feel free to um, share questions via chat. Um, and I'm sure that there'll be lots of other questions that come up for you as we go through everything. Um, my name is Angela Taylor. I'm the CEO founder um, of Inspire Community at Reach. And I'm also director of clinical services supporting our clinical team. Before we get started, just honoring the beautiful land that we're on, the land acknowledgement, we acknowledge that we are gathered here on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory. Um, these lands are the heartland of the Métis people. We acknowledge that our water is the source from the Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Inspires to commit uh, to truth and reconciliation and land acknowledgements are an opportunity to create awareness and understanding with respect to our commitments. About Inspire, Inspire is an incorporated nonprofit social services agency providing evidence and culturally informed family centered education and programming designed to meet the needs of those living with mental health issues and neurological cognitive differences, supporting youth and families with unique challenges and celebrating strength. Some questions about what we do in case you don't know. Um, we do um, an in-home family stabilization unit supporting families that include children and youth with um, all kinds of differences, um, including neurological um, diversities or neural complexities, um, and uh, youth um, all the way up to 29. Transition planning, so either from daycare to school or school to school, and sometimes from home to home, depending if there's co-parents involved. In school support, we are very fortunate to work with amazing educators all over the province and beyond um, in regards to neurological differences and the impacts of mental health and cognitive differences um, as well. Uh, we do lots of advocacy with families um, in regards to getting the needs met of children, um, professional consultation, very fortunate to work with really incredible clinicians and social work. Um, um, individuals and frontline staff and all kinds of educators, all kinds of really amazing people um, who request information about evidence, uh, research that, that um, I do privately um, uh, through school, um, as well as kind of the information that we, we gather alongside community here at Inspire. Report writing and assessments. Uh, we don't do diagnoses, but we do lots of different types of report writing um, and a, a very comprehensive assessment in terms of neurological differences. We also do group training for caregivers and professionals, uh, parenting programs, uh, some groups as well with uh, for youth. So we do lots of really diverse things at Inspire and we're always looking to fill social services gaps alongside community and individuals because they know what they need best. So a question that I get a lot is what do we mean by complex families? And of course that's quite a, a complex answer but I'm gonna do my best um, to describe it. Um, so complex is a combination of many needs, which includes neurological, cognitive, uh, physical, and mental health. Complex families refers to two or more people in the family um, or even one individual in the family that has multiple things going on. Um, so example is a parent with ADHD and a child with um, autism spectrum disorder or autism. And it also could be a parent that has ADHD and autism for a child that has um, a variety of differences as well. It could be anxiety, it could be something else. So essentially complex um, refers to um, uh, individuals that need multiple sources of support um, and that's how they thrive. Um, complex families have limited resources where they can go and find information because for the most part, um, the world is not made for disabilities and it's definitely not made for complex neurologies and complex disabilities. Um, families that live with disabilities have many additional barriers and the research that I've done and that I'm doing really only begins to um, unearth the complexities and the challenges that we live with. And I speak from personal experience as somebody who is neurocomplex or neurodivergent. And I also have children that are wired in similar fashions. Um, this is an example. Um, so um, for the last many years of my master's degree and on my PhD, I have written about my experience as being 
neurologically complex and being um, working with complex children. Um, and September 30th, 2015, as I read about complex children, I realized the connection to trauma and the horrid things that happened to us as children. Being complex is a placement in society, a description of our relationship to accessing the services needed to resolve the hurt that we feel. Being complex is not a description of our brains as we were born necessarily. So the first time I ever um, discovered um, the word complex was in, re in relation to um, the social services field many, many years ago, six years ago. And all the literature at that time was summarizing children in foster care and how individuals in foster care were generally categorized, please excuse that language, um, but kind of labeled with this idea of being complex due to needing lots of services. And now that term has evolved and now it's used in many different ways, but throughout the last six plus years, um, this is how it originated. This is my introduction to this idea of being complex. Complex families have several risk factors. Marriages have an increased risk of experiencing relationship distress and breakdown. So families that include children with disabilities um, and uh, multiple disabilities specifically, um, increases that likelihood. Um, we have uh, marriage breakdown and, and high levels of stress and distress within uh, a partnership or um, um, uh, the, the caregivers of the children. Now, uh, there are many, many reasons due to that or, um, or that because of that's due um, and, and nothing is in regards to that child's differences or disabilities. Um, um, that unique, beautiful child is not the cause of those challenges. That unique, beautiful child is in an environment in the world that's not made for those disabilities. And that's the issue that's caused um, the, the relationship dysfunction or relationship challenges to the caregivers. And so that's a really important lens and uh, understanding to have. And the more research that we do, the more that we connect the dots, the more we understand that it's not because of the individual that has sensitivities or differences, it's because the environment doesn't offer the resources and adaptations it needs to have the people that live with differences succeed and thrive. So um, families that include children with disabilities, again, are more likely to have caregivers that are single earners, either unemployed or underemployed single parents, because dealing with a child's additional needs makes finding daycare or finding time to research and engage in opportunities more difficult. Again, because the world is not made for disabilities and complex needs, we have a situation where the ownership, the time, the stress is carried by the caregiver. And um, um, further to that, female caregivers, um, or um, in this case, mothers, which is the majority of the research, um, kind of shares that um, individuals that have gone through the research process being mothers that we carry about 80% of the, the load of caregiving, even when our, our partner or the co-parent is involved and heavily involved. And so that is really important for us to know as service providers is that there is a lot of undocumented or un, not being honored kind of activities in terms of planning, case planning, um, support uh, for environmental pieces, finding resources, because resources are so difficult to, to manage. And again, it's not simple. We can't just look at the stats or look at, at um, the evidence and say, okay, this is this causes this. There are so many factors that are um, environmental or beyond the family's control and specifically not at all to do with the individual um, that has sensitivities and complexities. Um, we're more likely as caregivers to have a family history of neurological differences and an increased risk for mental health disorder. So the people, the caregivers who are in the prime position to support that amazing child are at really high risk. So for example, in my family, I have five neurodivergence. I have five neurological differences within my brain. And so I had these amazing children and they're the best. And also there are several of my children who have neurological differences as well. And you know, I can understand and adapt environment and their neurological sensitivities are still there. Um, so that's an important piece, um, as well as there's a link between neurological differences and significant mental health disorders, such as anxiety and depression, and sometimes psychiatric disorders as well. 
Now the overlap again is complicated. Um, in terms of um, anxiety, for example, if you are living in a world that's not prepared for you, and no matter where you go, you're not really thought of, or there's no resources, if, if you're needing specific things, you can't access the support you need, are you going to be feeling more or less anxious? So the fact that they're linked makes perfect sense to me, again, not because of the individual, it's because the system isn't really made for them. Um, one of the reasons is because an individual's um, that have neural complexities and have differences and sensitivities, we aren't necessarily the ones leading the research. We're not the ones that are planning um, governmental pieces or resources to help the population that we're serving. And so that really is something that's been evolving over the past many years, but is a huge challenge for the individuals who are currently experiencing um, care and receiving care, but also the individuals who are trained and supporting these families information is not accessible to you yet. That's changing, but how can you know something that's really difficult to know unless someone shares it with you? Another piece in terms of psychiatric disorder um, is that actually neurological differences, they're generally gonna be in the same part of the brain. Tons of really delicious research that I could share with you for like days and days and days. But in summary, if the same part of the brain is being affected but with bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD, um, um, autism, FASD, all these different neurological um, disorders or differences. Um, it's really interesting that uh, if you have one, for example, there's like an 87% likelihood if you're an adult to have multiple or more than one. Why is that? Well, it's all the same part of the brain. So the fact that I have five is actually not a shocker. It's kind of like, oh, congratulations. Like if you're gonna have one, you're gonna have all of them. Um, and about learning to, um, to deal with it, for example, it reduces stress, reduces the cortisol levels. Um, the cortisol levels actually of caregivers is extremely high. So it's really important to understand about complex families is that um, the level of uh, internal distress or cortisol, the stress hormones, um, there's research that suggests that mothers, again, it, primary research focus, that mothers have the same levels of cortisol as an active combat soldier. So somebody who's actively in combat has a similar level of distress as somebody who's raising a complex child. Again, not because of the child, not because the parent is amazing, but because the system's not made for those sensitivities, for those um, challenges, behavior, uh, behavior challenges, for example, medical challenges, for example, needing multiple avenues for support. Um, and having to juggle all of that in addition to maybe safety concerns um, and not having access to financial resources to pay for all the additional costs of having this amazing child. So all those things are what impacts this, um, which is obviously complex. Um, what does it feel like to be neurodivergent? I am so happy you asked. I've actually had a few like professors and educators um, come to me and, and ask me, like, what is it like? Because <laughs> when they find out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my PhD, I'm a researcher, um, I have a very specific skill set. Uh, I'm really good at like this new thing, um, but I'm really good at them. And so I'm like, in some ways, I'm the classic neurodivergent person. So they ask me, like, what is it like to be in that brain? Um, and, and it's complicated. Um, there are wonderful things, there are challenging things. Um, in terms of having one and then having additional diagnoses through the years, honestly, it's been really helpful for me to understand that that's why I felt like I never belonged. That's why I always felt different. That's why connection is so hard for me. That's why I have preferred, you know, areas and topics in my life that are like really, really sticky. That's why I have sticky thoughts that just never want to leave until I deal with it. That's why, that's why, that's why. So for me, understanding about what it is to be neurodivergent was really like shining a light on who I was and why I was the way that I was. So uh, one of the examples that I have to share is June 16, 2016. Um, if I hear normal, just a setting on the dryer one more time, I'm going to lose it. There are things in society that are seen as normal, and I feel frustrated when that is denied. Raising these complex children, I feel like I must shout things from the roof, rooftop. Um, don't deny my children their experience of working so hard to fit in, in a world that they're not welcomed into. As I raise these kids, I see myself reflected in their differences. 
their sensitivities are my own. I've just spent my life avoiding the reality that I'm not normal, the normal that I sought to be. I will never be, um, and neither will they, and that's lovely. We are not neurotypical. So for an example, this idea of neurologically typical um, is like approximately 85% of the population are wired in a typical way. And there's approximately 12 to 17% of individuals who are wired as neurodivergent or wired in a different way. And that, again, so much research, I, I, I won't bore you with all the things, but we are more similar than we are different within that 15% in my opinion, because they overlap in symptoms. They overlap in sensation, in sensitivities. All those things are overlapping. We aren't typical. We're not meant to be typical in a lot of ways as like embracing this idea of neurodivergence, neural complexity, is that finding that, that cloak, finding that magic within myself of, of identity and saying, this is the way that I am, this is the way that my children are, um, being diagnosed as an adult instead of a child and kind of struggling to fit in and having to wear a mask of being normal in environments that were judging me for literally everything I did that seemed odd, right? Being able to, to learn about why I felt the need to wear that mask, um, seeing my children as the beautiful humans they are with their sensitivities and the way that they think in quite different ways really invited me to think about myself in a positive way. And what I'm noticing is that that's really common now in adulthood is that we're having these children who are being diagnosed, uh, perhaps in school or, or through other avenues. And as parents, we're going, oh goodness, like all these things that are disorders about my child are like, sorry, child, also you're welcome. I made you exactly like me. Um, and so that, that connectivity needs to be normalized. Getting diagnosed or finding out that you're different as an adult needs to be normalized. Being different, needs to be normalized or else we're not really going to share the lived experience of being neurodivergent or neural complex. And then who's going to know all these wonderful helpers who are investigating and trying to figure out how to support us. They're never truly going to understand how, how hard it is. And we're going to be having to wear those masks of trying to be normal um, forever. And I have to tell you this idea of wearing a mask and trying to fit in when I don't is exhausting. There's actually really good research on neural fatigue. So the neurological exhaustion of trying to fit in, it actually makes our symptoms, our behaviors, our experience worse. So we're trying so hard to fit in and then we try, 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 collapse. Um, and then it's like uh, some of those funny memes about how you, you know, okay, I went and I, I, I socialized for that 20 minutes. Now I need two days to recover. In some ways it's true and we're all different. It's, you know, we have different sensitivities and we learn to adapt in different ways, but the lived experience is my brain is never off. It's like a hamster just running around. It's a, it's a cute hamster, it's friendly, but it gives her and it's very intense. So this idea of like, just put your feet up. Why can't you relax? You know why? Cause I'm not wired that way. So the positive parts of that are, I can problem solve like nobody's business. My brain's actually hungry for problem solving. It's only when I can't problem solve that it's a problem. That's a whole other TED talk. But this idea of solution focused is really delicious for me. When I connect one piece of information to thousands in a sweet second, like a spider web, they're all interconnected. It makes me really good at my job, it makes me an excellent tracker of behavior. It gives me certain skills that other people can't have and I don't, I, growing up, I didn't know that. I didn't know my areas of passion. I didn't know that my brain was wired this way, that I had this opportunity to be me and have really good skills in this tiny little area and be really happy and joyful. I didn't understand that there were sensitivities to all my sensory input, taste, sound, smell, everything is more intense for me. I live with intensity. And Again, I didn't understand that that was different. I thought that was for everybody, that everyone thought this way, everybody felt their emotions strongly. But the truth is I find out actually now as an adult, that's not the case. I'm not typical. I'm not meant to be typical. And individuals who are neurodivergent when we're given the space 
to be ourselves, that's when we become innovators. That's when we become pushing the system in just the right spot um, to grow and, and change because the system was made by and for individuals who are typical and there's a huge population who is not. So that's changing and that's beautiful. So what does it include? Okay, so when we talk about neurodivergence, neurodiversity, so explaining the terminology is really important and we'll get into the language in a minute, but what does it include? This is the key. They all overlap, okay? So they're neurological and they're cognitive. They're psychiatric and they're neurological. They're physical and they're neurological. So, and, and you, you'll notice that like, even within one, well, it could fit here too, or maybe it doesn't quite fit there. Um, it's really incredible that like, as we're doing this research and we're uncovering layers and layers of, of MRI brain scans and, and, and hearing people's experiences that we're, we're noticing that they do overlap in a very significant way and we only begin to scrape the surface. So psychiatric illnesses, not typically thought of as neurological, are so neurological. This is super interesting. And the stats say that if you have a diagnosis like ADHD, for example, which is technically cognitive, I suppose, I don't know, um, it actually, if you have uh, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, you're more likely to be bipolar or you're more likely to have schizophrenia. You're more likely to have OCD. Um, so all of these things, they're super, super interconnected. Um, some things that aren't listed on there is actually homesthesia. Synesthesia is something that I live with. It's one of my um, it's one of my neurological differences, and it's essentially for me. It's when I hear music, I see really vivid colors and shapes. Um, you know, so it's not a disability, but it is definitely a, a neurodivergence. It's a different way of being. It's a different wiring in the brain. It's super common, and I actually didn't know that anybody. Like, I didn't know that that was different. All of my diagnoses, I actually didn't know that that made me different. I didn't even know what they were called. It was just the way that I was and you know, the way that I experienced the world and all my um, differences and, and diagnoses is that the way that I was wasn't accepted and wasn't good. So that's also something really important to note is that that's the history. By the time you meet us and you're offering a service, this has been our experience for decades. And due to all of those negative inputs of being this way and maybe not knowing or being this way and knowing, all the inputs that we receive, we get no more, we're rejected more. The stats are high, the stats are clear. Um, and it causes all kinds of sensitivities like rejection um, sensitivity, dysphoria or rejection sensitivity. Up to 99% of individuals with ADHD are, you know, also have this other sensitivity, rejection sensitivity in terms of like, we're looking in our environment and we're, very sensitive to rejection. Why? Why do all these people with ADHD have it? Um, this sensitivity, the stats again say that our inputs, our teachers, our parents, our, our, our you know, community members, all of these people, they, they reject us for our symptoms or the way that we are in the world because they don't expect it. They don't know how to deal with it. So our experience for decades is that the way that we are isn't good. So that's how they all overlap in terms of um, mental health and neurological differences. Psychiatric, bipolar, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, even soci um, sociopathy, uh, physical um, differences like Parkinson's, um, um, dyspraxia, which is, you know, could be also considered cognitive or appear cognitive, um, developmental speech disorders, intellectual ability or disability, um, obsessive compulsive, uh, Tourette syndrome, dyslexia, um, so all of these things, again, it's super complicated and I feel like they're adding new things all the time. Originally neurodivergence or being neurodiverse, depending on the language that you use or what's common for you, um, was actually started specifically for autism. So, and then that also is, you know, a, a cognitive difference and a neurological difference. So there's so many layers to this and it, we, we do keep um, kind of broadening our understanding and the terminology follows that. So most frequently there's a bioneurological basis for these neurological conditions, which means like biological, we were born that way. And then there's also addition of acquired neurological differences through illness or injury. And there's some questioning about 
post-traumatic stress disorder and the overlap of illness and injury, brain injury due to that, but it can also be from a physical injury as well. So again, super complex, so many layers, so delicious. So what communication differences are there? Um, there are, so in terms of being neuro neurologically different, I have my own lived experience of my multiple uh, neurological differences, but then also combining that with informa information um, given to me by, by the community, answers from the community, but also literature, because I like research, it's really fun. So in terms of communication differences, intensity and frequency of these differences are variable and can be dependent on the environment. So both social and physical environment affects how we interpret information because statistically it's not just my brain differences, it's the input of society up on me that make my symptoms and my experience either easier or harder. So something that's really, in my opinion, like really misunderstood is selective mutism. So I have, I've heard just so many different things about it, but um, essentially it's a way of, um, um, I guess, buffering out this input. So like, if you are trying to talk to me and I don't want to talk to you, uh, it's a real, it's a real good way to like shut that out. It's actually usually a survival technique. So individuals who are under a lot of distress or in a lot of distress, that is a survival technique as a way of kind of buffering the environment, especially social environment. So individuals kind of being like, I just can't right now. That idea of shutdown and survival response, fight, flight, freeze. So either like flight, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of here, uh, is pretty clear communication. Um, the fight response, again, communication, um, and the freeze response as well, that idea of shutdown or even the mutism, for example. Uh, communication differences, notoriously, I'm told I'm intense. I mean, come on now, hardly. Um, but it's, it's statistically like that, something that's tracked. And, and, and from the community perspective, it is, you know, and the service perspective specifically is we can become really animated. Um, we can become like really intense or we're trying to get our point across. You gotta, you gotta listen, those types of things. We can interrupt more than the average human. We can also share information that does not seem connected, but to our neurology, because there's so many more pathways all condensed in a smaller, you know, a smaller portion of gray matter, um, those pieces seem really connected to us. Um, verbal differences, words, phrases, echolalia, stick to thinking. Um, my son is one of the loves of my life and he is so good at echolalia. And so he will be, uh, you know, sometimes talking in a British accent and he's just like, you know, here you go, um, pip pip and all that. And so he's talking about Thomas or he's talking about Peppa Pig or he's talking about something else. And he's connecting to what we're doing right now in a way of sharing it with me. Hey, this is really sticky in my mind. It's really cool. You got to hear it, right? It's kind of a gift if you think of it like that, an invitation for relationship. So that's a communication difference, again, that's misunderstood. It's not always connected to the situation, but usually it is. And if you think about the brain, like a Rolodex, it's like everyone has a Rolodex of knowledge and you just pull it out at the right time. Now, either you, you don't have quite the right stuff in there yet because you haven't learned it or the stuff that you have makes perfect sense to you and you pull it out. Another thing too, in terms of verbal differences is that sticky thinking. So we like to talk about, you know, like what we like to talk about. So for example, you might, you know, might not at the superstore want to be like, hey, Angela, what kind of research are you doing about neurodivergence? And I'll be like, let me tell you something, right? That's my preferred um, topic. That's my, my, my topic of interest. And so if, if you're going to talk about that, I'm going to want to talk about it, for example, for a long time. Or you might ask me something else and I might connect it to something that again, doesn't seem connected, but I'm going to pull it out and it makes perfect sense to me, probably about my sticky thinking, probably something connected to something that I'm sticky about. The sticky thinking that most of us have are things that help us feel safe. They're things that we feel excited about, happy about, um, that kind of give us that dopamine hit or that feel good sensation, feel good hormones. So those are really important to know too, is that we're, if we're bringing it forward is because, you know, it's important. Um, it also might be a stressor. We might bring forward a stressor and get really stuck on stressor. And we're trying to find a solution for it. We're trying to figure out the why. 
And so what, in terms of communication differences or challenges in working with a family with complexity is that they might feel really stuck about this one thing and they might keep bringing it forward. We're like, we already dealt with that, but did you? But did you? Uh, our processing speed is different. In some ways, I am super quick with like synthesizing data, this with this, with this, with this, bam, magic. But if you talk to me, I need a good 10 seconds. I may need a minute to regulate myself and calm myself. I may need a minute to understand what you're saying. If you keep talking, well, good luck. I'm not gonna understand you. Um, so processing speed is really important. My son actually taught me that. I remember, um, <laughs> I remember trying to get his attention and the moment that I realize, like if I say his name over and over, for example, like, hey, I need your attention, it's really important, um, it's gonna be less effective than if I say it once and wait 10 seconds. So processing speed is really important in terms of differences with different types of neurological differences. And again, it's not the same for everybody, we're all unique. If you know one person with, that's neurodivergent, you know one person, um, right? That's like, in terms of the autism community, that's something very well said you know, one person with autism, you know, one person with autism, it's the same thing with, with, with all people, but especially neurodivergence, because a lot of assumptions are made. Um, we can speak very directly. Uh, that sometimes sounds demanding, okay? Because of the way that we process information, it's very black and white. It's this or it's this. Um, this is right, this is wrong, okay? And so in terms of communication, it can kind of feel prickly at times, especially for those um, that are, you know, more sensitive or don't understand the way that we're wired. So I actually give warnings to people. I'm like, heads up, I, I communicate in a very clear way, or I, I think it's pretty clear, <laughs> and I need information in a very clear way. And if I receive information that's not clear, it's going to be, my response is going to become that much more directive because I'm trying to find a solution. I'm trying to find an answer to this communication or exchange that we are in. Sharing, um, sharing is a way of connecting. So what I was talking about with my son, of him kind of communicating with me or trying to share something with me, um, it's, a way of, it's a way of communication, it's a way of connecting. And so sharing a story, for example, even if it seems like an inopportune time, um, that's why we're doing this, because we're trying to align, connect. An example that I read about a lot and I hear about a lot in terms of a complaint by service providers or even sometimes friends is, you know, oh, I'm having a terrible day, this thing happened, and then they describe the thing. And then a neurodivergent person might say, oh, I remember when I had a thing, and it, it's in, in our North American society, it's like a negative response. You shouldn't be, you should be validating. You should be listening. For us, that is us listening. We're showing you that we listen. We listen so well, we connected it neurologically to something else that happened for us. Um, another communication thing that you should be aware of is uh, challenging behaviors or information. Uh, two pieces of that. The first piece is that if we're in a high level of distress, uh, that's information to you to, to, to adjust for next time as a service provider, okay? So for example, I was in a situation recently where I was told, okay, click this link. Uh, I'm gonna have a meeting on time. This is what's up. I'm like, okay, great, click it, click it, click it. Oh, doesn't work, okay, no problem. Okay, I'm gonna try clicking it this other way. Okay, doesn't work. Okay, I'm gonna try clicking this, clicking this, clicking this. Nothing is working. I'm emailing them saying, I've tried these three ways. They're not effective. Let me send you a link. I know for sure it will work. Here's a solution. Doesn't respond. Sends me another email saying, I guess you're not interested in kind of meeting. And I was like, oh. So then I'm feeling upset. I'm feeling like I can't either, I have a choice here. Either I'm gonna become escalated or I'm gonna to have to step away. And so challenging behaviors to me when I see them with children, for example, or parents, it's communication to me, it's information for me to adjust my behavior as a service provider to ensure that that doesn't happen again, for example. Um, another piece about challenging behaviors um, is that um, this idea of sensitivity neurologically uh, and that fight or flight survival response is it happens more often, again, complicated, not necessarily due to just the individual, it's the societal inputs and not being prepared for. So in some ways, you're gonna be seeing more challenging behaviors, especially until you adapt. Adopt the environment, adapt the relationship, adapt how you 
you know, input on the individual, and those things really um, can support. How to reduce miscommunications and misinterpretation. Okay, number one, don't make them. No, just kidding. Uh, they're gonna happen, we're humans. Humans make mistakes a million times a day. And within relationships, of course, they're gonna happen. Especially if, you know, if we're sensitive and we're wired different, perhaps you got some trauma mixed up in there. Um, so, so I think for me, it's about being kind to myself. It's about knowing that miscommunications and misinterpretations are guaranteed to happen and that it's okay, it's normal, and they can be repaired. It's not devastating, it's not the worst thing ever. If I make a mistake, which I will, it's not because I'm incompetent or I'm the worst or that something I've done is terrible. It's not gonna affect every single thing ever and it's not gonna be forever, right? Kind of minimizing the neurological effect or the distress effect within us as service providers is gonna be really helpful. As individuals, you know, perhaps as, as a neural complex individuals, is understanding, you know, the, the society's not really, they're not up to speed about how it is to be us yet. And that there will for sure be miscommunications and how can we as the neurodivergent population be really clear on what's helpful for us is gonna be a huge piece of shifting society. And I wish it wasn't, you know, so much to do with us, but it, 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 really, it really is in our voices being am amplified, for example and people are taking notice about what's helpful because they wanna provide good care. So in terms of communication and, and kind of fixing things, reducing mis misalignments, details of preferences and level of need is dependent on many things, including neurology and sensitivities, okay? It can change minute to minute, day to day. It changes all the time depending if I'm working from home or I'm working at the office, depending if I got an email from somebody I don't like, okay, because I'm mean to me, um, depending on if I'm having something to look forward to later, then my, my experience of me is going to be quite different. So understanding in terms of uh, reducing assumptions and reducing mis misalignment or miscom miscommunications, um, here's some tips and tricks that the community said, like, this is really helpful for us. So understand that we're justice warriors, okay? Uh, that sounds a lot better than like fixation on, you know, what's right and wrong. No, like we're, we're warriors, okay? Um, so in terms of like rules, if I've learned that this is the rule, you follow this document, this is what is, everyone is doing this, okay? Then if I find out, if I see someone else is not following the rules, in my brain, I'm like, I have to fix that. I got problem solve it up. Okay. So a lot of these kids that we're working with are going into, you know, the, the play structure, and then they're saying all these things. Oh, you gotta follow the rules. You're not following the rules, and blah blah blah. But also, one of the rules is that you're not supposed to like boss other people around. Okay. It doesn't matter. In that moment, in that child's mind, they are doing what is right. They are a justice warrior. So making sure that there's really clear rules, and also that the that supporting children with neurodivergence to really understand their role within the rules. Whose job is it? What's a solution, et cetera. The definition of words is something that I've talked about so many times and it's so frustrating. I am in school, I love school, I love my professors. And sometimes they'll be like, okay, uh, like it's gotta be good. And I'm like, what does good mean? I don't understand what good is. Like, that's like telling your child, you behave yourself, what does that mean? What does it mean? And so really being clear, you know, you know, I want you to be safe by holding my hand when you cross the road. That's clear. It's an expectation. And also in addition to that, you can further explain. The more detailed, the better, in my opinion. So, you know, I want you to be safe when we're crossing the road so that uh, a car doesn't harm you right? Your safety is important to me, you know, all that stuff. That to me is really definitive. It's really clear. Um, consistency between statements, actions, and those with an environment. Listen, like, I'm sorry, my brain connects a thousand things a minute, okay? And so consistency between what you say and what you do, what you said on July 7th and July 27th, guess what? Sorry. Um, and so everything within my environment needs to be consistent. I need to know what to expect. And if you do it the one time, please do it that one time like that. 
for good or have a conversation with me about it needs to be different. That's it. My brain likes that. And I don't intend to track behavior and language. I don't intend to do that. It's both a gift and a challenge for me. So within my relationships, I might just say, hey, why did you do that? Because my brain says, nope, that's not a thing. A lot of kids that we're working with, they'll become quite upset and they'll say, you said this. Well, they're not wrong. You did say that and you did opposite. Be consistent because we're tracking it accidentally and slowly. Black and white and logistical thinking and need is super important, okay? So this idea of clarity is extremely important. It has to make sense to us. It doesn't make sense, we're not gonna do it. So this is a challenge within the education system all the time. If you don't explain to me why it needs to be done this way, you're not proving its worth to my time. And that's not a matter of me being difficult. My brain is rejecting whatever it is that you're offering. It's not a choice necessarily. Sometimes it starts as a need and it becomes a behavior, but the root of it needs to be addressed because if you don't feed the need, it bites you. Large bulking of information versus point form. Um, I am very fortunate to work with colleagues who understand me. And if they send me a 15 page email, if they send me a full page email, there's just punctuation problems and spaces that not spaces. My brain goes, nope. If they send me something that's very clear, I want this. This is the information, point form, point form, point form. My, my brain's like, mm, yum, here's your response in five seconds. My brain actually, part of it's the dyslexia, but my brain actually can't take in large bodies of information. And if it's not formatted, my brain literally rejects it. So sometimes I'll get an email and I have to split it all up and I'm spending hours kind of putting headings and bolding this. And this is larger, it's a heading. This is bold because it's important. Um, you'll notice even on here, everything is point form. Right? It's accessible to read for all kinds of people. Because if you think about the majority of folks that can kind of accept things however, and the people on the outskirts like me, if you make them, make in, in things inclusive and accessible for all the people, everyone, including the folks in the middle, get their needs met. Another piece is step-by-step -step information. So um, instructions is like bad for me, is bad. Okay, super smart human in certain ways. And if it's not in step-by-step -step of number one, do this, number two, do this, then it's very hard for me to follow. If it is in step-by-step -step information or, or sequence like that, um, I can pretty much do anything. But a lot of us who are neurocomplex are this way. Offering example of what you mean is helpful. Um, in school, I really struggled with this. If, if they said, okay, I want you to do, you know, I want you to do, here's the assignment. If I don't have an example of what they're actually looking for, like this is a topic you might choose. This is the structure. This is the heading. This is this, this is this, this is this. Um, I'm going to really struggle. I have uh, an amazing educator who offers, it's blank. There's no, there's no data in it. There's no answers, right? With that's just so much in education. That's what's worrisome is they're going to have the answers. It's, there's no answers in it. It just has an example of the format of the information within each heading that I need, then I'm gonna succeed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna exceed your expectations, but it has to be clear of what you're looking for. Same thing with social services. Be clear with the date, the time, the, the form of information that you want. Is it by email? Do you want me to call you? Is it by Zoom? Tell me the things and I will do it. What are the most common triggers for individuals who are neurodivergent? Every single person is unique. And so are their triggers in either intensity, duration, or type. The most common are sensory, okay? So for example, for sight for me, part of it is like when there's a lot of people and it's really, really busy, that's a trigger for me. My anxiety increases, my symptomology of being neurodivergent, it's going to intensify. Um, for me, um, like taste, so sensory is really important. I like very flavor, flavorful things. Um, I don't like anything in terms of sensory um, and taste how they're connected because they're all connected. Uh, anything sticky? Mm -mm. Nope, mm -mm. nope, can't do it. I hate candy so much. Mm -mm. Um, sound is super important for me. So one of the, the, the pieces that is misunderstood is that sound is both my trigger and my most powerful soothing. 
So the fact that I have the window open, that there's trees rustling, I hear everything all the time. Um, so if I have no power and control over what the sound is, uh, like the song or the details, for example, how loud it is, and if I can't get away, trigger, okay? So that idea of like the type, even how I'm listening to it makes a difference. So if I have certain, this earphone or this type of earphone, that makes a difference to how, if it's a trigger or not. So it's really important to understand that. Sensation or touch, uh, I, don't, I don't do tags, okay? I'm so thankful that it's socially acceptable for me to wear leggings all the time. Um, these are things that are really important. I have a young man who, um, well, little guy, a sweet little boy, who um, hated going outside. And everyone was like up in arms, like, oh, he's got to go outside, activity, nature. And he was like having these giant meltdowns, like a trigger response um, to like just being distressed. And he was communicating with his body, his voice, this is a problem for me. And I realized it was just, it was just the jacket. <laughs> it was the jacket. It wasn't outside. It was the jacket. The sensation of the scratchy is not a thing. What's really interesting too for triggers is sometimes it's not the, the one thing happened the one time. For my body, my body saves it up, okay? I have one of the stories from my, in my book, um, Forever on Fire, that's specifically about me going for a walk in my, my favorite place, okay? And I've been looking forward to it and I drive them. Yes, I'm taking it. Picture, okay? Got my music going. And then I realized that my sock has gone down and my rubber boot is rubbing, okay? And it hurts. And pain for me or sensation for me, it's either euphoric or it's painful, okay? There's not a lot of medium because I'm intense. My neurology is intense. So this scratching, it hurt me. And I had to make a choice. Either I'm going to have all of these positive inputs of the trees are dancing, the smell of nature, the sound, all of these things, input, 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 good. And then I have to make a choice. How am I gonna deal with this input, input, scratchy, scratchy time? And it's gonna save up in my system. If there are negative things adding up in my system, I have to make sure that the positive things or the things that are joyful are, are bigger or more, or else I'm gonna be agitated, I'm gonna be anxious, and I'm gonna be a little bit prickly. Nobody wants that, it's a scary time, okay? So all of these pieces are not necessarily, oh, one thing happened one time and now there's a trigger. It's been adding up into the system and my body feels like I can't contain it anymore. It feels unsafe, it feels, my nervous system says you're in danger and then you go into fight or flight and that's what the trigger response is, okay? Research shows, shows that social and environmental inputs impact us significantly with evidence showing that how we experience our disabilities depends on it and it shows up in our symptoms and behavior. Oh, it's delicious research, love it. What's the preferred language and terminology, okay? Now who you ask, in community, depending on their diagnosis, their experience, where they are in life, if they're an academic, if they're not, all of these things impact how we perceive and experience language, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, generally person-centered, right, is gonna be best. I am not my diagnosis. My diagnoses are part of who I am, but I'm me. My, this is my, my kind heart. This is my intelligence. This is me and who I am. So it's really, really important to keep that in mind and offer respect in the terminology and also own that we're going to make mistakes. And if we say things the wrong way, guess what? That's being human. And now we learn. It's an opportunity for learning and growth. My favorite and least favorite thing. Okay. I do want to share with you this. <laughs> okay. So there's tons of terminology. There's in terms of um, uh, there's, there's neurodiversity, which was the umbrella term. Okay. There was um, neurodivergence, which means I am neurodivergent. Okay, I'm within the neurodiversity community, but I am neurodivergent. Um, there's neurominority, which is like, you know, in terms of there's neurologically typical people and they're wired typically, and I'm a minority because I'm neurologically diverse. Okay, just to make it more spicy. Okay. Um, there's also, yeah, there's neuro fatigue. There's all these labels that we use, right? I am an individual that lives with, um, neuro, within neural complexity. So essentially what I, the terminology that I created last year uh, while I was researching 
was like, I'm a complex person, okay? I, with the old definition of complexity, which it was for foster care, the new definition of complexity, which is like encompassing, you know, all kinds of individuals with, with different, uh, different neurologies, different types of uh, disabilities, whatever. Um, and then also neurologically, I'm, I'm diverse and I'm complex. So if you look at this, this idea here, there's the neural biological differences, right? If you do a brain scan, you will see one brain is different than another brain, okay? That is the neurological differences as studied by a neurologist. And there's real proof to show that my brain is different than somebody else's who's typical, okay? It's fantastic, it's delightful. Now, there's this, there's this happening up here, but there's also my lived personal experience as being somebody who's neurologically diverse. Okay, now my symptomology, my expression of being different is dependent on my environment. So there's this going on, there's this going on, and now there's this going on. And that in combination is what being neurocomplex and the experience of me being neurocomplex as well as the neurocomplex population. It's one term that encompasses many different things. You can also read more about it in Forever Empire. What are some successful adaptations for service for community members? Improving success. So psychoeducation, understanding through science, what is happening in our brains and our bodies for you and your team? Family engagement practices, asking the goals and pain points the family might have, super important. Do not make assumptions about the person, including what will work. Look for positive intent and need. I would never intend to harm anybody, ever. Not even in my imagination when someone is really terrible to me for long periods of time, I still can't imagine being harmful on purpose. Am I harmful? I have been, and I probably will be again. It's never intentional. Um, and so when people look at my intentions as good, I'm calmer and I present very differently. Look at uh, or increase communication clarity and skills. So grow your communication skills as a service provider. Own your mistakes and repair. I feel like that's the most important one. You're gonna make mistakes. It is the worst for me as an individual who's neurologically sensitive to be in a relationship and have the other person when I bring something forward of like, hey, you said this was always gonna happen and this, this happened, you know, what's with that? And they're like, actually, no, it's in your mind. That is the worst because my brain knows that's not true. And that's called gaslighting and it's terrible. Stop doing be a lifelong learner. Um, one of the best gifts that I ever um, gave myself was permission to learn forever. I'm never going to be the expert in all the things. And even though I am an expert technically on neural complexity, um, I'm, I'm, it's, I think the reason I'm an expert is because I have the lived experience and I've been studying it for a long, long time, but I'm hungry for more. I want to learn the things I don't know. And to me, that's what makes an expert. Ask them what works or has worked for them and their family. That's how we're going to learn. How to repair relationship fragmentation or hurt. Listen, it's going to happen, okay? It's going to happen. You're human. You're going to make mistakes. We know that, okay? Um, part of it's reciprocal. So, like, we're going to be kind to you about your mistakes. Please be kind about our mistakes because we're going to have lots, too. Let the individual lead, okay? Um, in terms of, like, repair and, like, uh, prevention, uh, letting the individual lead, understand that they are the expert in themselves and their family. It's very powerful. Power sharing, okay? I'm, I'm a clinician. I have really good skills in what I have skills in. I don't know everything. I, I, I hardly know much, okay? But this idea of that, like, I'm a lifelong learner. You're the expert in yourself. I'm not above you in any way. In fact, in, in knowing you, you're above me, 100%. So coming in humble, is really important. And that's a way to repair. And that's also a way to uh, prevent. Apologize and be specific. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That means nothing to me. Because I'm so literal and because I'm so logistical, tell me the why, answer the why. What happened? What actually happened when you didn't respond for three weeks and I had to go to your supervisor? What happened? Help me understand. That will be a huge key in repair. Make a plan of how you can be a better fit for them in the future. And guess what? You're not gonna be a you're not gonna be the best fit for all of us. 
Nobody is. I know the expectation as helpers is that we're supposed to be magic to all people. And guess what? Sometimes I'm not the best fit for a family. And it is very humbling to say to my supervisor or to have my clinicians come to me and say, you know what, this family is amazing. And it's also not the best fit for me. It's triggering. I don't have the skills they need. What can we do to support them as a team together? That idea of multidisciplinary teams is super integral to the well-being of complex families. Just ask them, ask the families, what positive things, what are some positive things about your child, right? Know the individual, general updates and family well-being is also gonna repair because we know each other, right? It's not, I'm providing service to you as the big, you know, fancy human. No, like, you know, I'm here because your family's amazing and I have some support to share and you need support because you're a human and all humans do. How can I be the best support for you? What have you noticed as a family that works best? How can I do that? So those are really, really important pieces. Um, uh, I wanna say thank you. Uh, I'm gonna to check to see if there's any other questions um, in the group, um, but I would really encourage you to check us out on Instagram, Twitter, uh, our Facebook page, our website is inspiredcommunityoutreach.ca. Um, we have um, a, a new training in neurodiversity level one and level two, which is a certificate program that's like a lot of data and research has gone into that. A lot of the information can also be found in uh, Forever on Fire because I've been researching this topic for a long time. I just like put it all in one nice place, all tidy. Um, we'd love to have you check out our YouTube channel and we've got lots of free resources there. And if you're looking for support for, for your family or you want to refer to us, um, the families that we support, they do not need a diagnosis. They do not need a referral. And the wait list is extraordinary, sh extraordinarily short because we try to reduce all the barriers um, for families as possible. And waiting more than a couple of weeks for service is just, is not a good fit. So thank you guys so much for um, connecting with us. And we look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>